Well, the NATO military alliance has wrapped up a major summit in Madrid. On Wednesday, President Biden announced plans to greatly expand the U.S. military presence in Europe, including building a permanent headquarters for the U.S. Fifth Army Corps in Poland, while also deploying more troops to Romania and the Baltic region. Biden said this is part of a broader NATO expansion, in part as a response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And together, our allies, we're going to make up sure that NATO is ready to meet threats from all directions across every domain, land, air and the sea. On Wednesday, NATO formally invited Finland and Sweden to join the military alliance after Turkey dropped its objection to the move. This comes as the Biden administration's publicly announced it would support the sale of F-16 fighter jets to Turkey. Once Finland and Sweden join NATO, it'll more than double the border between NATO countries and Russia. Current members of NATO share a 750-mile border with Russia. Finland alone has an 830-mile border with Russia. On Wednesday, Russian President Vladimir Putin warned against NATO deploying troops or weapons to the two countries. There's nothing that might concern us in terms of Finland and Sweden becoming NATO members. If they want to, please go ahead. But they should clearly understand that they didn't face any threats before this. Now, if NATO troops and infrastructure are deployed, we will be compelled to respond in kind. This all comes as NATO's described China for the first time as a, quote, systemic challenge to Euro-Atlantic security, unquote. NATO, which stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is increasingly focusing on China. The military alliance took the unprecedented step of inviting the leaders of Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand to attend the NATO summit in Madrid. For more, we turn to Anatole Levin, senior fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, author of of Ukraine and Russia. His latest piece in The Nation is headlined, A Peace Settlement in Ukraine. Anatole, thanks for joining us again. If you can start off by talking about all these developments, as we're broadcasting, President Biden is actually holding a news conference in Madrid. But the increased troop presence in Europe, uh, Poland establishing a permanent base, uh, Finland and Sweden coming in uh, to the alliance and inviting South Korea and Japan. Uh, uh, New Zealand and um, Australia to in, not into NATO, but to this meeting, so they can start to talk more about what it, NATO is considering um, a threat, China. Well, <laughs> that's a lot to cover. Uh, I, I suppose one thing to note uh, is that, uh, as as your report said, I think uh, today. Um, Russia announced that it was withdrawing um, from Snake Island in the Black Sea on the coast of Ukraine, which has occupied since the beginning of the war. Uh, and Russia said, of course, it was doing this as a gesture of conciliation. But the general analysis is that Russia uh, was withdrawing from Snake Island because it was simply uh, suffering you know, too many casualties and losses of ships to hold it. Uh, now, you know, I think what that does indicate pretty clearly um, is that, uh, you know, on top of the way that, you know, Russia uh, was defeated by Ukrainian forces with Western weaponry outside Kiev has been, you know, fought not quite to a standstill, but almost um, in eastern Ukraine. You know, Russia is not uh, the nearly uh, the military great power uh, that uh, the Russians obviously thought it was, but that it was also portrayed as uh, in the West. Um, and in fact, a former NATO secretary general, uh, Anders Fogh Rasmussen, has, uh, has acknowledged this. So you see, there is a, a, a certain dissonance between uh, Russia's actual military strength and performance and NATO's response, because uh, you know, to to be blunt, if if you know if Russia takes weeks and weeks to capture one small town in the in in the Donbass, uh, the thought of it invading Poland or, or Romania, it's it, it's not actually serious in in military terms. Um, and uh, as far as Finland and Sweden is concerned, well, you know. Uh, uh, one understands perfectly why, you know, they have been so 
alarmed by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, but it is also true that Russia has not threatened either of them militarily since the end of the Cold War. So I suppose that's one thing to point to. I mean, as far as China is concerned, um, there are, I suppose, two points to raise. The, the first is that to have set out on a focus uh, on the Chinese threat, while at the same time being deeply embroiled in, you know, acute tension with Russia and, you know, backing the other side in a in a in a war with Russia, you know, does not look like you know like wise strategy for NATO. Um, you know, there should have been some attempt to ratchet down tensions with one or the other. I suppose the other obvious point to make is, um, as you said, I mean, NATO stands for the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. You know, there are the members of NATO are all on or close to the North Atlantic. The United States is there because it is a, an Atlantic power. To the best of my knowledge, China is not present in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, and it does raise the question both of, you know, whether NATO should, whether NATO's charter in fact allows it to deal with China as a threat, or whether you know you, you should have a quite different organisation for that, uh, but also of course whether whether China is uh, actually uh, a threat to um, the North Atlantic countries or such, as such, or, or whether it is uh, only in fact a threat to American primacy in the Far East, which is a very different question. I mean, Anatole, when this uh, uh, announcement was made by NATO to include uh, uh, China, they said that uh, China represents, uh, threatens uh, NATO's, quote, interests, security and values. Uh, so, and together with making this statement, including China, they also, for the first time, invited countries from uh, East Asia, as well as Australia and New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, Australia and New Zealand. Could you explain why you think they did that now and what this implies for the long-term uh, goals of, of NATO? There are two reasons. I mean, one is that obviously as China becomes, you know, more and more powerful, uh, economically stronger and stronger, it does raise, you know, uh, understandable anxieties uh, in the, uh, the democratic countries of the West. That, however, you know, is not the same as a security threat to, to, mm -hmm. to Europe. Um, and um, the uh, other, and as far as values are concerned, well, you know, I was listening to the, um, to, to, to the, to the program. Uh, it, it, the, it, it's, I have to say, it's, it, it really seems to me that the obvious threats to Western liberal democracy are internal. You know, they are about, de you know, all the things that we know about um, socioeconomic inequality, demographic change, driving internal extremism uh, and, um, you know, cultural anxieties. Uh, and China actually ha has nothing to do with any of this. Um, it's, you know, to some degree, it is actually a distraction. And remember, I mean, you know, the, the whole point of NATO in the end is to defend Western liberal democracy. Now, it, 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 by, you know, by looking militarily at China, even to a degree by, not by supporting Ukraine, you understand, that's absolutely right, but by building up this idea of Russia as a massive threat to the West, is NATO really concentrating on the most important dangers to, to, to liberal democracy, I, I wonder? And as far as uh, uh, to turn now to uh, uh, the what the situation in Ukraine is, your recent piece for the nation is headlined a peace settlement in Ukraine. If you could elaborate the argument that you make there and in particular uh, the point that you make regarding the status of the Donbass and, and, and Crimea and why that must in any uh, uh, peace settlement be left for future negotiations. Well, uh, the, 
the thing is that the, the, the first Russian demand, a, a treaty of neutrality, has actually in principle been accepted by President Zelensky. You know, it, it's there on the Ukrainian presidential website. The point being, as Zelensky has said, that uh, before the Russian invasion, he went to NATO countries and asked for a guarantee of NATO membership within you know, a reasonable space of time, five years. And they all said, no, 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 sorry, you're not going to get in. So, you know, fairly enough, Zelensky said, OK, then why not a treaty of neutrality? Um, now, of course, the Ukrainians have asked for some very, very firm guarantees of Ukrainian security as part of a treaty of neutrality. Those, however, I think we won't go into detail about now, but they are negotiable. You know, we, we can think of some some good ways of, of, of addressing that. The territorial issues are much more uh, complicated because um, there are basically incompatible positions there. The Ukrainian you know, insistence on full sovereignty over, you know, uh, all UK Ukrainian territory as it existed when Ukraine became independent in 1991, uh, and the Russian claim of sovereignty over Crimea uh, and recognition of independence of the Donbass separatist republics. And then there is the issue, you know, it, I'm sorry, it gets horribly complicated, but you know, these, these, the, these issues always are. Um, there's the point that Russia has recognized the independence of the Donbass republics on the whole administrative territory of the Donbass, uh, but actually still uh, has not occupied that whole territory. You know, it, it, half of it is still in Ukrainian hands. So it's going to be very hard to negotiate. Uh, however, the Ukrainians uh, have said that if Russia will withdraw from all the new territory it has occupied since the invasion began, uh, Ukraine is prepared uh, to essentially shelve the the previous territorial issues for future negotiation. At least that's what Ukraine said previously, but th there have been wildly different statements uh, coming out of the Ukrainian government. It's clear that there are, well, firstly, that there are deep divisions within the Ukrainian government and elites. And secondly, of course, once again, I mean, very, very understandably, uh, as the war has progressed, as the destruction by Russia has got worse and worse, as, you know, there have been these revelations of Russian atrocities, so naturally, um, the Ukrainians have been more and become more and more embittered, and more and more of them have decided that they have to fight through to total victory. But I think, you know, we also have to recognize that viewed from outside, I mean, I've said that I think it's quite impossible now for Russia to win a total victory in Ukraine, but it does also look very unlikely that Ukraine will be able to win a total military victory over Russia. So in the end, one way or the other, we're going to end up with some sort of compromise. So, Anatole, if you can comment on the G7 reaching an agreement um, around uh, a price cap on Russian oil experts, uh, exports and the backfiring of the sanctions. The New York Times writes, despite the sanctions, Russia's revenues from oil sales have been on the rise, a function of soaring fuel prices, while consumers around the world have faced mounting pain at the gasoline um, pump. Well, uh, um, two things about that. The first is that, you know, Western governments should have thought about this before the war, this threat, a very, very obvious one, and done much more to try to avert the war, you know, by seeking, well, for example, the treaty of neutrality, which Ukraine has now offered. Uh, because, I mean, you know, obviously, I mean, not just uh, oil and gas, but food as well, it was perfectly obvious. Uh, that, you know, massive sanctions against Russia uh, would, you know, have this effect on global energy and, and food prices. Uh, so, um, you know, that's the first thing. The second thing is that, um, look, we don't know, but there are already, you know, obvious splits um, behind the scenes between, both between European governments, but also between some European governments and America on, you know, the approach to the war in Ukraine and a, a peace settlement. And I mean, European officials I've talked to in, in private have said that, you know, going into the autumn, if, you know, Germany is facing a winter of, you know, a widespread contraction of German industry as a result of lack of energy, if European governments are going into a winter with energy shortages, with radically higher 
uh, energy prices. If there are, you know, by then uh, either serious threats of global recession or if we're already in a global recession, then of course I think you you are likely to see, um, you know, much more pressure uh, for a some attempt at a compromise peace or at least a, an agreed ceasefire in Ukraine. And what I tried to do in my essay for The Nation uh, was to suggest to uh, Western policymakers some of the contours, in, in my view, the only viable contours um, of what such a, a peace settlement could look like. And do you think, uh, Anatole, finally, um, that the signs at the moment, I mean, the fact in this, uh, the fact of, of NATO expansion, the, the presence now of U.S. troops, increasing presence of U.S. troops in Europe, uh, in symbolic terms, the ascension of uh, uh, Finland and Sweden, and, you know, NATO saying uh, yesterday, the uh, uh, Jens Stoltenberg saying that allies are prepared for the long haul on Ukraine. This, together with the fact that as far as if, if one takes Russia's word for it, if this was all about NATO, things are going uh, uh, not quite as they had planned. What indication <laughs> is there, given both these things, um, that, that uh, uh, anyone, either party, would be interested in, in beginning ne negotiations anytime in the near future? Uh, well, I mean, you're absolutely right, of course. And look, I, I mean, I, I'm not naive about the, the chances. Uh, but I think, um, you know, when you said uh, that um, things have not exactly gone to plan, as far as Russia is concerned, that is quite an understatement. Uh, you know, this has been a disaster for Russia, uh, of course, and it's been a disaster militarily. I mean, re remember that Russia has actually failed to achieve almost all its key military objectives in Ukraine. It's failed. It's been fought to a standstill. Um, and uh, to go on and on like this is going to cost you know, enormous Russian casualties and not necessarily, you know, gain any more significant ground. So that, in principle, you know, creates an incentive to seek an agreement. And of course, the Ukrainians are also suffering terribly. And I think it's also worth remembering that, you know, Ukraine now does have a, a genuine chance for the first time of future membership of the European Union. And, and that is, I mean, that is really the, the mark of Ukraine joining the West, much more than NATO, you know, if Ukraine can join the European Union. Uh, and uh, But it can't do so as long as it's, uh, you know, in this war with uh, the Ukrainian economy being shot to pieces by the Russians. So there is also, of course, a, an incentive for the Ukrainian uh, side to try to reach an agreement. But look, uh, I'm not saying that this is easy. As far as Stoltenberg is concerned, I mean, look, remember, Stoltenberg represents the NATO bureaucracy. He doesn't head a government. He's not elected. He doesn't have to care about energy prices, unemployment, inflation, any of these things. He actually doesn't even have to care about starvation you know, in Africa or the Middle East uh, as a result of food shortages. Uh, because of the war. So, you know, the, the people who are ultimately going to make the decisions are the elected politicians uh, who do have to care about these things. We want to thank you, Anatole Levin, for joining us. Senior fellow at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft will link to your piece in The Nation, headlined a peace settlement in Ukraine. Coming up, we look at how the far-right Supreme Court has radically reshaped the United States. We'll speak with the ACLU's David Cole. Stay with us.